Ocrevus is one of the most popular drugs to treat multiple sclerosis, but how good is it in the long run? Let's take a look at this observational study that followed people taking Ocrevus over nine years. Are they still doing well nine years later? And do you need to start Ocrevus right away, or is it just as effective if you wait a few years to start the medicine? Also, is it a safe drug for long-term use? Is there a risk of serious infection or cancer? To give a little background, Ocrevus is given intravenously once every six months, 600 milligrams, though initially the first dose is usually broken into two 300 milligram doses given two weeks apart. The drug Ocrevus itself is a monoclonal antibody that targets this protein, CD20, on the surface of B lymphocytes. When it binds this protein, it causes the cells to lyse or break open and die, and it's believed that B cells are important in initiating inflammation in multiple sclerosis. Common side effects include infusion reactions, such as getting rash, hives, or wheezing during the treatment, and it is an immunosuppressant and can potentially cause infections, though the other white blood cells, like the T cells, neutrophils, and macrophages, are not affected by this drug. Here are some data from the old randomized trials that led to Ocrevus getting approved for multiple sclerosis. This is data in relapsing MS, the OPERA 1 and 2 trials. I was actually a rater for these trials. I examined patients and evaluated their disability and contributed to this data many years ago. They compared Ocrevus versus Rebif. This is an older, lower efficacy medication, an injection beta interferon 1A given under the skin subcutaneously three times weekly, and they looked at confirmed disability progression. This means that someone's disability, as measured by the EDSS scale, Expanded Disability Status Score, a measure of disability in MS research, it worsened, and it wasn't just random fluctuation because on follow-up exam, the person with MS was still worse, so it was a true progression of disability. That was more likely with people taking re beta interferon 1A compared to Ocrevus, the blue line, and Ocrevus reduced disability progression by 35.6%, so it was more effective. Another thing they looked at was no evidence of disease activity, which means no relapses, no new lesions on MRI, and no progression of disability, and 72.5% getting Ocrevus had no evidence of disease activity versus only 43.8% with Rebif, so again, Ocrevus was better. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday. Also, I'm going to be attending the American Academy of Neurology annual meeting in San Diego, April 2025. Perhaps I'll see some of you there. I may do a little media there. I'd be interested to know if you have any suggestions for interview questions I could give to MS experts around the world post in the comments below. Now let's move to the article in question, which is an open label extension of the randomized trial I just showed you. So people were randomized to get either Rebif or Ocrevus, but after that study ended, after two years, they could just take Ocrevus. So it's open label, everyone knows they're taking Ocrevus, it's no longer blinded, and we're gonna learn two things. One is what happens to people taking Ocrevus long term, and also do people getting Rebif in the randomized trial, even though they did a little bit worse on average, do they catch up to people taking Ocrevus, or do they remain worse off for the remainder of their disease, or at least over the nine-year study? There are many famous authors on this publication, Bruce Cree at UCSF, Timothy Vollmer, Gabriel Pardo, who's very active on Twitter. Congratulations to them and the other authors on this excellent publication. And as I said, they followed them over nine years. There are 757 participants. 382 who originally got Rebif and 375 who originally got Ocrevus and now they're all going to be on Ocrevus. And they did an intention to treat analysis meaning that they would just compare people based on how they were originally randomized. Some people maybe they receive Rebif and even though they don't know it's a placebo they can tell it's Rebif because of the interferon side effects so maybe they drop out of the study and that creates some biases, so it's more pure to just compare people based on how they were originally randomized. It's considered to be less biased. 
These are the baseline characteristics of people in this study. Those who were originally randomized to Rebif on the left, those originally randomized to Okravis on the right, and they were very similar. The average age around 35 to 36, 64, 65% were female. You can see the duration of diagnosis is very short, 0.6 years, and the starting EDSS was only 2.4 on average, which is fairly low. So people were younger with relatively low disability at the start of the study, and many had gadolinium enhancing or active lesions, 41 to 43 percent. They did a fairly good job keeping people in the study. You can see those who originally got Rebif on the left and those on Okravis the whole time on the right, and various reasons why people quit the study, for instance, having adverse events or feeling the treatment was ineffective or just wanting to quit the study, but 68.8 percent of those on Okravis the whole time stayed in the study versus slightly less 64.7% of those who were originally on Rebif and then changed to Okravis. So now let's move to the results. This is 24 week confirmed disability progression. Again, this is when someone worsens in terms of their EDSS score and upon being reevaluated 24 weeks or around six months later, their disability is still worse, confirming that it's real progression, not just random fluctuation or a mild mild relapse that improves. And you can see by the end of the nine-year study, there was more confirmed disability progression in those who originally got Rebif, 30%, compared to those who were on Okravis the whole time, 26%, though not a huge difference. And this is entirely explained by the double-blind period. You can see the lines separate early on and stay roughly parallel to each other, but people do not catch up just based on being switched to Okravis, they still suffer essentially a permanent penalty for originally receiving a lower efficacy agent. Not necessarily a large penalty, but some kind of permanent penalty. However, this does argue against a therapeutic lag effect. There's this idea that maybe you take Okravis, excuse me, you take interferon early in the disease, it's not very effective, you have relapses and new MRI lesions, but you're young and resilient, you recover, but you suffer the consequences many years later, that didn't seem to be the case in this study. They did worse, they had more disability progression, but upon being switched to Okravis, they then had equal benefit to those who were on it the entire time. Again, there's a difference, a small difference, but it appears to be real. It was not actually statistically significant though, the p-value is 0.135. When looking at relapse rates, those who were on Okravis the whole time had very low rates of relapses the annualized relapse rate, relapses per person per year, was 0.05. In other words, an average of one relapse every 20 years, whereas those who originally got Rebif and switched to Okravis, it was 0.09. It was higher, not quite statistically significant, p-value 0.09. And this was entirely explained by the double blind period. In other words, Okravis versus Rebif. And so if you're on Rebif, even if you have relapses, but you switch to Okravis later on, the Okravis is effective in suppressing relapses. Here we're looking at brain volume. Accelerated brain atrophy can occur in multiple sclerosis and disease modifying therapies have evidence in slowing brain atrophy. You're looking at percentage change in brain volume. It looks like a lot, but this is only 4% the entire scale over a nine-year study. And you can see those who were on Okravis the whole time had a little bit less brain atrophy, not quite statistically significant, p-value 0.09. And again, it's entirely explained by the double-blind period, and the lines become parallel to each other once everyone's on Okravis. But notably, those who originally got Rebif, they never catch up. Their brain volume is a a little bit less on average permanently, slightly less, but permanently less. They also looked at neurofilament light chain in the blood. This is a protein that's a marker of central nervous system injury. It can be elevated in various neurological diseases, including MS, and it's been correlated with worse prognosis, relapses, and more disability with a lot of individual variation, but on a population level, there is a correlation. During the double blind period, again, Okravis versus Rebif, those getting Okravis had lower levels by about 38%, suggesting 
less central nervous system damage. However, during the open label extension, when everyone's getting Ocrevus, they equalized. So this measure of damage was the same now that everyone's on Ocrevus, and levels were fairly low in the range of healthy donors. In other words, people without multiple sclerosis, suggesting there wasn't that much central nervous system injury going on. Now we'll move to side effects. This looks at all the adverse events. On the left is the randomized trial, beta interferon or rebif in the left column, and this column is Ocrevus the first two years, and on the right is all people getting Ocrevus at any time. So in the randomized trial, there were more cancers in people getting Ocrevus, but it was not a statistically significant difference. Infections were a little bit more common in people taking Ocrevus, 83 per 100 person years versus 65 in those getting Rebif, but there are actually more serious infections in people taking Rebif. Rebif is not an immunosuppressant, so this is probably due to random chance. If you look at the right-hand column, the rate of serious infections was 2 per 100 person in years, so one in 50 per year, that's pretty low, but over nine years, that would be 18%. So certainly serious infections do occur in people taking Ocrevus. These are the cancers that were reported in the study. There were nine cases of basal cell carcinoma, a relatively treatable skin cancer. Two people had multiple basal cell carcinomas. Six people had breast cancer. Three had melanoma, one was metastatic melanoma, two had colon cancer, another person had an introductal proliferative breast lesion, and there were individual cases of prostate cancer, chondrosarcoma, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, and papillary thyroid cancer. I would actually find this to be reassuring over 700 people over nine years, many following through the end of the study. This is probably not higher than the background rate in the general population. In the randomized trials, there was some concern that people getting Ocrevus had higher rates of breast cancer, though the rate seems to be fairly low. Looking at infections, they also confirm what has been reported before multiple times, which is that to some extent we can predict serious infections by looking at the antibody levels. Immunoglobin G, the long-term antibodies in the blood, if they're less than the lower limit of normal, in other words, if they're below the normal range, there are 6.46 serious infections per 100 patient years. Whereas if you have normal immunoglobin G, you have roughly one third or less the rate, 1.94 serious infections per 100 patient years. So one way to reduce the risk is to hold or delay Ocrevus if immunoglobin G is low or change to a different medication. So to summarize, Ocrevus is superior to Rebif. I know a lot of the changes I was showing you aren't statistically significant, but there's a clear difference across multiple measures. I think Ocrevus is better, and I think that difference is sustained over a nine-year year period, people who originally got Rebif, the inferior drug, didn't catch up, though the difference in absolute terms wasn't that large, so you do have to consider the risk of infection, which is certainly higher with Ocrevus than with Rebif. There does not seem to be a clear therapeutic lag effect. In other words, people getting Rebif did worse during the randomized portion, but they remained equal to Ocrevus years later. They didn't develop worsening progression of disability many years later, which has been hypothesized as a possibility, didn't seem to occur in this study. There are no clear new safety concerns with Ocrevus. There does not seem to be a clear increased rate of cancers in this study, in my personal opinion. Certainly, Ocrevus can cause serious infections, though the rate is not extremely high, and we may be able to mitigate the risk by paying close attention to the antibodies and, of course, the person reporting significant infections. I'd be interested to know your thoughts. If you've taken Ocrevus, what are your results? What is it effective? Did you have side effects? Do you think the risk of Ocrevus outweighs the benefits considering this data you're looking at? And do you have suggestions for other videos?